Hi there, and welcome to Joy Sightings, edition number 15. Today I read to you Tales of the Kingdom and the chapter called The Faithless Ranger. Long ago, danger always came to the people of Great Park who were the most brave and to the places that were the most beautiful. Men and women were never what they seemed to be, for magic and mystery and wonder were always possible. But that is not so different from the way things are today. Not long after the boy Hero came to Great Park, he went exploring. He walked down across some craggy hills toward the duck pond, past Great Park Gardens and Mercy's Vineyards, and around the shores of Lake Marmo. He skirted the edge of deepest forest to faraway outpost meadow. Sitting beside Singing Swamp, he opened the lunch of cheese and bread caretaker's wife had prepared for him. Finally, at midday, he sought the cool shadows of wildflower woods. For the first time in his life, Hero felt content and protected. No burners chased him. No flames threatened. He did not know who ruled this place, but it was certainly better than Enchanted City. Suddenly, the sound of laughter surprised him. Following the sound, he discovered a girl sitting upon a stump with flowers between her bare toes. She was braiding her long blonde hair. She stopped, arched her arm, and a butterfly alighted on her finger. She turned at the sound of his coming. At her look, Hero covered his face with his hand. For one moment, he had forgotten his terrible scar. I woke up late, she said, not surprised to see him. Blowing the butterfly aloft, she continued pulling one flower after another from between her toes, weaving them into the braid. Welcome to the kingdom, she said with a smile. The kingdom? Hero echoed. Everyone knew there was no such thing. Then he stopped. Of course the girl must be pretending. He could play along. Oh, I suppose your father is the king. Oh, no, she answered. The king is my older brother, as he is a brother to all. Hero tried to not show his doubts. Then you must be a princess, he teased, looking at her much-washed pants and shirt. The girl was tying her gym shoes. She stood straight finally, curtsied grandly, pulling out the sides of her jeans with her hands. Yes, I'm the Princess Amanda. Welcome, Hero. Hero choked back a laugh and was surprised she knew his name. Before he could say anything else, however, the girl spat. Can you do that? she asked. Anyone can spit, thought Hero. He spat on the ground. Oh, but can you do this? Can you hit that toadstool over there? The toadstool was fifteen feet away and small. Amanda spat again and hit it, bullseye. Hero didn't know anyone who could do that. He said so. It's a gift, said Amanda. I have perfect aim. She spat again and hit a knob on a tree quite directly. I was just going to the practice field, but I thought I would pick some flowers for my hair. We're practicing for the great celebration. What's your gift, Hero? The boy thought, but nothing came to his mind. He was pleased when their conversation was interrupted by a cry that echoed through the woods. How goes the world? An answer came back. The world goes not well. Then another answer. The kingdom comes. That's the watch cry, Amanda explained. It goes from tower to tower. The rangers keep watch. They guard the park against burners and naysayers. They also look for lame things and fire in the forest, and they protect the outcasts. Their hearts are brave and full of courage. Then she started walking toward the practice field. Wait, wait, cried Hero. I don't understand. I don't understand anything. Amanda stopped. Tendrils of hair were already loosened from her braid. Some of the wild flowers had fallen. What's the kingdom? The kingdom of what? Where is the kingdom? Amanda's jaw dropped. She laughed in surprise. Why, that's the first rule of Great Park. 
A kingdom is any place where the king rules. The boy felt stupid. The answer seemed obvious, but he still didn't understand. I thought this was a park. Of course it is. It's Great Park, and the kingdom is in it. This is where the king rules in exile. But the kingdom is not only here, it is anywhere the king is and is obeyed. Someday the king's rule will be restored to enchanted city and everywhere. That's why we call out, to the king, to the restoration. Hero was pondering all this when, suddenly, a loud horn blew in the forest. It was answered by another and another, Croy! Croy! Amanda dropped the flowers. Her body tensed with action. The smile left her eyes. She cried out, Danger! Ranger horns! Sounding warning! The horns wailed again, then three short blasts. Croy! 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 Amanda shouted, Fire! Fire in the forest! Come! We must help! The horns are calling for help! Hero felt a sickening cavern open up in the pit of his stomach. Fires? His old fear rose to nauseate him. A vision of smoke and pillars of fire flashed behind his eyes. Death drums and a funeral pyre. The scar on his face began to throb. He covered it again with his hand. Amanda did not notice. Come, she cried. She grabbed Hero's arm and ran with him in tow through the woods. We must hurry. The two hurried to a large lodge built on the edge of deepest forest. Hundreds of rangers were gathering, men and women wearing long blue cloaks and the silver clasp at their shoulders. Some grabbed buckets, some shovels and brooms. Then they all rushed into the sprawling building. Hero and Princess Amanda entered and were pushed along by the crowd to the front of the large hall. On the platform, a tall and powerful-looking man was examining maps, barking commands, sending off small groups of rangers this way and that. Finally, he turned and motioned for silence. The hall grew suddenly still. The man in the front continued to hold up his hand. Hero noticed that his black hair was streaked with gray. The dark eyes blazed. He looked like he could be a king, if there were a king. Amanda answered Hero's unasked question. No, this is not the king. This is Ranger Commander. Fire in the forest, announced the commander. He pointed to the maps spread on the large boards. Two fires begun at distant points within a short space of time, here and here. A low murmur spread through the hall. That could mean only one thing. Someone was deliberately burning the trees and planning to set fire to the entire forest. These fires are in the third and fourth forest quad, 13th and 15th fighting districts. First alarm response crews are already in positions. Ranger Commander faced his maps and explained strategy. Mobilize at once. Spade and hatchet crews on this side and this. Bucket gangs waiting behind, to be ready to set backfires, but wait until the horn blasts signal you to begin. Remember, no more fire than absolutely necessary. He faced the waiting hall. Hero was awed by the feel of this man's absolute command. He called, Work hard. Pray for calm winds. Call on the rain. Then he shouted, To the king, to the restoration. The hall reverberated as each ranger lifted a hatchet and replied, To the king, to the restoration. Then commotion, the tramp of feet, a flurry of pushing as firefighters raced to their assignments. In an instant, ranger commander was standing beside Amanda and Hero. Come with me, he said to the little girl. Your gifts of seeing are of value to me. And you, boy, come too. You can help in a support crew. Amanda will show you what to do when we are finished. The man turned and rushed out of the hall. Confused, relieved, and strangely disappointed, Hero followed. He wanted both to be part of the drama and not to be. The powerful man hurried to a nearby watchtower and vaulted up the outside ladder two rungs at a time. Amanda and Hero did their best to keep pace. At the top, Hero looked out over all of Great Park. Was there anywhere else as beautiful?
Not in Enchanted City, for sure. The ranger on duty soon came over to them and pointed to two faint columns of smoke rising out of deepest forest. Small early fires, he reported, two miles apart. The hand pump and hose team at Lake Marmo can siphon water up to the first position if that fire gets bad. The second is going to be tougher. A backfire ring is probably the best strategy. Suddenly, Amanda pointed. Look, over there to the left. All four squinted. Before Hero could see anything, the duty ranger pulled a large curled horn from its place on the watchtower wall. He stepped out onto a narrow balcony circling the structure and blew three short blasts. Croy, croy, croy! In a fraction of an instant, the blast was answered from a neighboring watchtower, and the next and the next, the others more distant, and on and on into the forest. A new fire, ranger commander explained to Hero in a grim voice. The man pointed. See the second swirl of smoke? Now look to the north. The new fire is in the 21st district. Now Ranger Commander turned to Amanda. What do you see? The princess stared out into deepest forest. Then to Hero's surprise, she closed her eyes. A silent moment passed as the girl seemed to lose all awareness of her surroundings. Hero had a feeling she was looking deeply inward at things other people could never see. She answered, A blue cloak, a running man, a lit torch. She opened her eyes. They were wide with horror. Ranger Commander glanced at the ranger. Each of them were shocked to learn that the offender wore a ranger's cloak. We are more in danger than we know, the commander said in a voice thick with concern. That afternoon, three more fires flamed in deepest forest, six in all. Hero followed after Amanda, carrying barrels of drinking water to the parched firefighters who battled ring after ring. The first two flaming areas quickly quelled, one doused by water pumped from Lake Marmo, the other smothered by pails of dirt dug from the forest floor. But the third blaze had begun to lick a hungry patch through the forest before the rangers reached it. The firefighters hacked with their hatchets through roots and sawed at a distance from the rapidly traveling flames. Backup crews loosened a ring of dirt with their spades and then brushed flammable twigs and leaves away with their brooms so the hungry fire would be starved for fuel. Still the angry wall of flame came forward, moving closer and closer to Hero, who was mesmerized by his old enemy and could not move or cry out. He could not even throw down the basket of food he was carrying to the workers. Soon the firefighters started the backfire, a wall of flame that quickly sprang up to heaven. The rangers were fighting fire with fire, using the backfire to surround the other flames and leave them nothing to feed on. Hero was caught in between the two. He watched the flames rise higher and higher, growing hotter and hotter. The boy's eyes began to burn and his vision blurred so he could see nothing distinctly, just massive walls of dark red and orange and scarlet. Yet his body remained stiff with horror. Drifting smoke seared his throat and stifled his breathing. From far away he thought he heard the familiar sound of death drums. Oom um, papa, oom um, papa, oom um, papa. Then from nowhere, a ranger was beside him. He threw the boy over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes, grabbed the basket, and raced back to safety. Mute, Hero watched as the backfire leaped and danced, eating all the brush within the ring. The two walls rushed to meet. Finally, the oncoming flames embraced and roared, and after a while, died, because there was nothing else to burn. Then a hymn went up from the weary men and women, their faces blackened from smoke. He is the flame that burns the brightest, leaping upward in the heart of man. He is the ring of fire in each soul who warms all into being. The king, our king, is the king of fire and flame. The ranger who had rescued Hero folded the boy in his long blue cloak, which smelled a little of ashes and smoke. He reached into the basket, broke apart some black bread, and gave half to Hero. Not used to fighting fires, hey? Eh? Tough work. But I think we're done. This one's under control. Caretaker will finish it for us. Feel the rain in the wind? 
Caretaker's up to his old tricks. Yes, siree, rain's a-comin'. Hero wondered what the silly old caretaker had to do with the weather, but sure enough, he could feel the soft touch of cool air on his cheek. Splat! A great drop of rain fell, then another and another, then faster and faster and faster. Above the forest, high in the watchtowers, the ranger horns blew short, hurried blasts. Croy, croy, croy! Almost as if the horns had caused Amanda to find him, she appeared at Hero's side. Her face was streaked with soot, but she danced. She turned round and round, her hands lifted to the rain. Oh, that wonderful old silly old caretaker! He did it again! He called out the rain! She threw her head back and opened her mouth, drinking in the fresh water. Then she stopped still, as though she remembered something she had forgotten. The horns! The horns! They've called counsel! For a second time that day, the young girl grabbed Hero's hand and dragged him after her. I forgot, I forgot, Ranger Commander needs my seeing. The boy and the girl raced toward the lodge, two out of several hundred who were answering the summons. When they entered the lodge, they saw Mercy, who had set up a first aid station in the back of the hall. It was a confusion of poultice pots and torn cloth and cots, but the old woman worked efficiently, soothing the injured. Once all the rangers had assembled, dripping and exhausted, Ranger Commander walked to the middle of the platform and motioned for quiet. Divisions, he ordered. Everyone in the hall shuffled into order. Scrambled crews found each other. Wounded rangers limped to join their proper teams. Hero watched from a corner. All present, called Ranger Commander. Counting began. Division one present or accounted for, sir. Division two present or accounted for, sir. And on and on came the cries. Miraculously, not one ranger was missing. Then the commander, with blazing eyes, called, Amanda, stand forth. Mercy, caretaker's wife, stand forth. The princess took two steps forward, and the old woman walked from the back, a roll of bandages still in her hand. Stand beside, ranger commander ordered, and the two took a place on either side of him. What do you see, princess? asked the commander. Amanda closed her eyes and answered, Again, a blue cloak, a running man, a lit torch. What do you see? Ranger Commander asked Old Mercy. She nodded her head. The same. A traitor, murmured the powerful man. His tone was low, gruff, but all in the hall heard. A faithless one. Ordeal by passage, ordered the commander. Scarcely missing a step, the community of rangers marched one by one into a bare circle outlined on the floor of the lodge, the viewing center, to stand before these three who looked deep into each heart. Those who were pure bore it without shirking, marching into the center and out again, but those who had a shadow on their souls dreaded the time their turn would come. About midway through the column of rangers, Mercy made a motion with her hands. The ranger who was in the viewing center paused. His hand slipped beneath his cloak. Ranger commander looked at Mercy, question in his eyes. She nodded. He looked at the princess. She nodded as well. At that, the faithless ranger uttered an anguished cry. No! He pulled his hatchet from beneath his cloak. Holding it out in both hands, he turned and turned in a wide circle. Stay away! Stay away! When the ranger had cleared a swath around him, he stopped, raised his hatchet, and aimed to throw it at Ranger Commander. Who are you? asked the commander, absolutely calm, as though his life was not in mortal danger. And why has your heart turned faithless? I am a king's man, shouted the ranger. I have taken the king's vow. I am part of the watch of the protectors. You have not judged me rightly. You are mistaken. Mercy's voice was low and sad and gentle. No, sir. It is you. We have seen. Repent, said ranger commander, his voice rough. 
Repent and do penance. The kingdom will open to you again. I repent not, the faithless ranger held his hatchet above his head. I grovel not. One move and you'll regret it. He swung his weapon around in warning. Undaunted, Princess Amanda swiftly grabbed caretaker's hatchet from the silver belt that girded ranger commander's waist. Let fly and you'll regret it, she shouted. Hero watched as the bold girl pointed the blade toward the center of the empty circle. Carefully she sighted aim. She swung around her hatchet round and round over her head. A hum started, the mysterious humming Hero had heard when he first entered Great Park. The girl took one step forward and released the singing weapon. It tumbled end over end over end and latched neck to neck around the hatchet in the faithless ranger's hand. Circling still, it lifted the other hatchet out of the man's grasp and carried it thrum into the wall far away. The room was absolutely still. Hero's heart was in his throat. Spitting at toadstools was one thing, but the girl's prowess in combat was another. Ranger Commander spoke. You have loved the power of fire too much. It controls you. For the sake of Great Park, banishment to Enchanted City will be your punishment. There you will find enough fire. Pray that it will not burn your soul. Footsteps echoed through the room, timed and in order. A band of blue-cloaked rangers surrounded the man in the middle, one tore off his silver shoulder clasp. One removed the long blue cloak. Another demanded the silver buckle from the belt. Finally, another gathered the garments of the faithless ranger together and placed them in the hands of mercy. The rangers closed ranks around the traitor and marched him from the hall. A terrible and heavy silence surrounded the weary men and women in the lodge after the faithless ranger left. For the first time that day, Hero saw the proud head of Ranger Commander droop with weariness. Pray, he whispered, that the faithless ones may again desire to follow the king. Hero wondered, what would happen to the faithless ranger in Enchanted City? He had not met the king, but the boy knew at that moment that he would rather be among these people who used the king's name than among any others. If need be, he would give his life to Great Park. And the boy learned that a kingdom is a place where it is not enough to say the king's name. One must do the king's will in the king's way or lose the kingdom altogether.